So let's let's talk uh, uh, and continuing with our discussions about the shoulder. Let's move on to impingement. Uh, you know, so we we'll talk about impingement. We'll talk about what uh, the different types, uh, and then we'll start out with some that were very popular a few years ago that have become less popular in uh, this day and age. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about pathogenesis and uh, how impingement might affect the, the tendons around the shoulder and then we'll go into tendon changes. So there are several different types of uh, impingement that have been described in the, in the shoulder. One is acromial impingement due to a shape of the acromion. Another is impingement at the acromioclavicular joint space. All of these are part of uh, what people call outlet impingement uh, in a rotator cuff outlet. And then there is anterior impingement, which uh, is often called primary core cord impingement. And then internal impingement, which some people call posterior impingement, which is typically seen in overhead athletes. So Charlie Neer from New York City was someone who really popularized the concept of outlet impingement. Uh, he believed that it was a major cause of rotator cuff tears, and he divided it into three stages. And he th thought this was primarily a mechanical irritation of the supraspinatus tendon and to a lesser extent the infraspinatus tendon uh, due to uh, the bony anatomy around the acromioclavicular joint and, uh, and the acromion process. He, decided, he talked about three different stages. The first stage, you have edema and hemorrhage in the tendon. The second stage is more chronic and you develop fibrosis and tendonitis. And the third stage, where you get large bone spurs and frank tendon rupture. But the concept was this was all primarily a disease of, of the shape, really, of the acromion and AC joints. Uh, that's, not that's not really con considered the primary pathology here anymore, but we'll, we'll talk about that. The reason it's important to go through a lot of the history is one is, as you know, whatever we decide is the right thing now is going to be considered the wrong thing in five or 10 years. It's not, a, it's not uncommon to go back and say that the previous thing was actually right. We just didn't quite understand it properly. And the other thing is when you go out into practice, you'll be working with a lot of clinicians who believe uh, different pathophysiologic mechanisms of the shoulder. And a lot of, a lot of them will, will believe some of the historical things that other people don't believe. And it's not that anyone is right or wrong, but you have to be, as radiologists, aware of some of the historical concepts of pathophysiology in order to give the referring physicians exactly what they need, con considering their own uh, place where they believe, where their understanding of pathophysiology is located. So let's talk about anterior acromial impingement. John, do you want to comment about anything I just said? Um, well, there have been many changes and additions and subtractions in, in, in regards to the shoulder as well as other joints over the years. And some things that we have forgotten are back now. And uh, it's interesting how medicine works. Um, something is popular today and then uh, 10 years from now, it's no, mo no longer popular and people forget it. Uh, the same thing with impingement. And then people uh, relearn it. Nair, Nair was very popular for a while and, and um, not at UCLA, I don't think it was. But uh, uh, that was about the time I was uh, at UCLA and uh, uh, we were not too excited about Okay. Some of the things he was telling us. Okay, well, so anterior acromial impingement, it can be uh, called by a type 3 acromion. It can be caused by anterior sloping of the acromion, lateral downsloping, inferior placement of the acromion with respect to the distal clavicle, and uh, a disease of the distal muscular tendinous junction. Uh, I think that, uh, John, I, I think that. Uh, that concept has been around for many, many years and has never been retracted. The anterior chromial impingement. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, you can also get disease at the acromioclavicular joint. You're all aware of that. 
due to osteophytes and fibrous hypertrophic callus formation. So talking about the types of acromion, the, the three types of acromion were classically described in the outlet plain film view, projection radiography, <clears throat> uh, by, uh, I believe it was Bigliani and the group in New York, in New York City. Uh, there's a slight variation of this on MR scan, where I like to use the oblique sagittal images, and it's similar but not identical to the plain film outlet classification. Uh, it was believed by Bigliani that type 1 had very low risk for impingement, type 2 had intermediate risk, and type 3 had high risk. What I'll describe here, I believe type 1 and 2 have very little risk for uh, impingement, and the type 3 has an increased risk. So type 1 is a relatively flat acromion in the oblique sagittal plane. You see a very gentle slope here, but this is basically a flat acromion, no anterior osteophyte. Uh, type 2 has a general curve, but stays pretty much equidistant between the humeral head and the acromion. Uh, these, I believe, are T1-weighted images. We now like to do our oblique sagittal imaging with non-fat-suppressed T2-weighted images. Many, many people like to fat suppress them, but we'll, as we go through different pathologies, I'll explain why we've decided to stop doing the fat suppression now. Some of our referring physicians like fat suppression in this plane, so we'll add it as an additional sequence for them. And here you can see the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons underneath it. Uh, type 3 acromion is where you have an abrupt narrowing of the distance between the anterior margin of the acromion and the humeral head. And it can either be congenital, which we see here, a nice smooth cortical surface, or acquired osteophytes, which we're seeing here. Uh, we've been able to follow a number of these form over time in the same patients. Uh, the original acromion, probably the, the, the cortex was right through here. And this is a developed osteophyte that, that's been acquired. And these are right along the uh, insertion of the corticoacromial ligament. And just like we see osteophytes at the uh, plantar aspect of the calcaneus, which grow along the plantar fascia origin there. The pathophysiology of the development of these is you get partial tears at the ligament or tendon insertion on the bone. The body tries to heal that. Soft tissues don't heal very well. We've talked about this before. Bone loves to heal. So what happens is the bone grows into the tendon or ligament uh, to, to reattach it and heal it. And that's and re recurrent strains and partial tears, healing recurrent strains, partial tears over and over again, induces the growth of these osteophytes. And you see the same thing around joints where the capsular insertions are. But bone loves to heal, and that's why if you have a bony avulsion of a tendon or a ligament and you reattach that, it often heals very well because bone likes to heal. Bone to bone heals very well. <clears throat> so anyway, that's that's this anterior acromion, and this narrows the space, often limits the, an the normal anterior excursion of the humeral head, which could then impinge the anterior margin of the supraspinatus tendon here. And this was believed one of the reasons why supraspinatus tendon tears tend to occur in this particular location. So it was believed by Near that for the many, many patients, the impingement came first and the rotator cuff tears came second. Most people don't believe that's the most common presentation anymore. Okay, and here's just, and you can see another acquired osteophyte, and you can see a lot of tendinosis and abnormal increased signal intensity in that anterior portion of the supraspinatus tendon uh, underneath the osteophyte. The other thing that you, you, you can get over time are these irregular uh, osteophytes uh, involving the cortical bone of the inferior surface of the acromion, often with a lot of bony thickening here or ebernation. Uh, and this is probably an indication that you have abnormal rubbing of the tissues in through here and you get a bony reaction here. And this is commonly associated with irregularity of the superior margin of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, and this may be a cause of partial bursal side tears of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, so I generally comment on the irregular uh, acromial osteophytes here, and often you'll get remodeling of the inferior aspect of the acromion process, especially when you have full thickness supraspinatus tendon tears and superior migration of the humeral head, which are all no 
know about, but we'll talk more about it later. And on the T2 weighted image, you can see the abnormal increased signal intensity within the bursal side aspect of the tendon. And you can see that abnormal tendinosis here uh, on the axial T1 weighted images. And uh, generally, basically, this is thought to be a mechanical problem. If you take a saw and you take off the teeth, you can saw all day long and you're not going to go through that piece of wood. But if you put sharp teeth on it, then you can saw right through a big, a big piece of wood. So th this is kind of like putting teeth on the saw where the chromium process is the saw. Here's just another example. Uh, here we get have a little bit of lateral downsloping. The next cut over would actually show the bone a little bit better, but this cut actually shows the increased signal intensity along the superior margin of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, the tendinosis uh, most likely caused at least in part by uh, irritation and rubbing of the superior surface by laterally downsloping the chromium process. And here we can see Though the tendon was intact in this patient, we see a lot of fluid, and if you window it properly, you can see some synovial thickening, uh, where it's believed that this process not only can produce tendinosis of the superior surface of the supraspinatus tendon, but irritate the bursa itself, producing a bursitis, subacromial subdeltoid bursitis, and that used to be a very common diagnosis for shoulder pain uh, back when this was considered one of the major uh, pathogenic mechanisms of pathology in the shoulder. Again, uh, I think this does happen, uh, but it's not the primary mechanism, of, or it's not the most common mechanism of injury to the, it's no longer believed that it's the most common uh, mechanism of injury to the rotator cuff anymore. And here we can see that irregularity of the anterior superior margin of the supraspinatus tendon uh, due to the outlet impingement from a laterally downsloping acromion. Here's just another example. We can see increased signal intensity along the superior margin of the supraspinatus. This marked irregularity of both the morphology and the signal intensity within the inferior chromium with a moderate degree of lateral downsloping of the chromium. And again, here we can see fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, but the supraspinatus tendon is intact. So this is probably another primary bursitis from impingement process. And here's another example, and here you can see the bursitis, which is lower in signal intensity on the T2, but bright on the PD fat set. So that's typical subacromial bursitis from a lateral downsloping acromion. And here's this more uh, bursitis. This is an arthrogram, and you can see that this, this there is not a rotator cuff tear. You don't see a communication of a defect through the rotator cuff into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, but on the PD fat sat images, you can see a lot of fluid and a lot of synovial thickening. Here, we don't have much of a, of a lateral downsloping acromion, but this is another example of uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. And here's just the axial images. Uh, I think one, one, one of the major problems, if not the major problem uh, with shoulders and other joints is the fact that um, individuals, uh, we're all different in terms of anatomy. And um, we have habits in terms of how we use our extremities. Um, and in fact, the neck and back, et cetera. And I think where there is a difference um, between like supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and other uh, structures, um, they, they're, they're fighting against each other and not synchronized properly. And I think that's where we fall on our face um, in, 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 in our anatomy. Um, if if everything was perfectly placed uh, and synchronized, uh, this wouldn't happen other than for age. But what happens is that we're, we're, we're not built uh, quite uh, symmetrical uh, in, in our anatomy, uh, as you obviously know. So I think that's what's the biggest problem with the shoulder and other joints. Thanks, John. Uh, further examples where we can see the irregularity of the inferior surface of the acromion, especially on the PD fat set, this uh, high-grade partial bursal side tear, uh, 
of the supraspinatus tendon where it looks like the deep fibers are intact. And it's important when you describe this. Uh, this is really would be considered a high-grade partial tear because it involves more than 50% of the thickness of the tendon. But if you do arthroscopy, you'll probably see a normal joint space here and no tear. And uh, if so it's important to describe this because this may well be the, the cause of the patient's symptoms. Uh, but, but you've got to warn the surgeon that there's a that there's a high-grade partial tear, but it extends to the bursal side, not to the joint side. So if they do arthroscopy, uh, they've got to expect that they're not necessarily going to see this. And I, I've had a number of complaints in the past from orthopedic surgeons who do arthroscopy. They say, well, there's, they called a tear, but there was no tear when I did arthroscopy. Uh, uh, and that's because it wasn't properly described that this is a bursal side high-grade partial tear that does not extend into the joint side surface. Uh, and so, John, uh, wouldn't you say that the foot plate is pretty bare there? Yes. Yeah, there, there's a bit. Except for the medials. And so if you did arthroscopic surgery, you would see that uh, things are intact medially. Yes. But uh, you would see the tear on the outside, it, uh, in the burs bursal side. Yeah, but, but then you'd have to stick the scope into the bursa, which people don't do routinely. Yeah, I understand. Um, but in this case, you would have to. Right. And that's why it's important to describe this properly in the MR report. Yeah. Otherwise, the, the, the surgeon would miss the boat. Yeah. And then here we can see all this uh, synovial thickening and fluid within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa uh, due, due, in this case, to the high-grade partial tear with subacromial bursitis. And here's a, another example where we can see some hibernation and uh, inferior osteophyte on the acromion process and a focal uh, near full thickness, maybe full thickness, but probably near full thickness, bursal side tear in this particular patient as well. So people started been looking at, uh, here's one question, does subacromial bony anatomy correlate with risk factor for rotator cuff tears? This was believed by NEAR to be the principal cause of rotator cuff tears. Uh, and that now it's been shown in not only this study but others that there really is not a good correlation between rotator cuff tears and subacromial impingement anatomy. Uh, I still start my first paragraph with this probably in large part because of historical reasons. But still, I think uh, subacromial impingement is a real factor, even though it's not the primary cause of rotator cuff tears, as was thought in the past. I think it still is a cause of symptoms. And though I don't see uh, acromioplasty as nearly as common as I did 15 years ago, uh, there's still occasional times when I think it's probably warranted. Uh, the next thing is lateral downsloping. Uh, it's considered that the normal acromion should be horizontal, uh, but uh, this mild degree of lateral downsloping is is very common and not and not associated with symptoms. One thing to look at that I think is important is really looking at the cortical surface. If the cortical surface is nice and smooth and uniform like this, then you probably do, do not have significant mechanical problems going on here. So it's unlikely that this is going to be a cause of symptoms. If you see the osteophytes and the irregularity you saw in those previous cases, then I think it's likely that that can be a cause of symptoms. So it's less the, the, less the downsloping and more the looking at the cortical surface. John? And that, that that goes back to x-ray days, doesn't it, John? Yes. Yeah. And then so and then here's another one. Here's a, it's basically the same degree of moderate lateral downsloping, but here you can see irregularity of the inferior cortex and these little marginal osteophytes and some remodeling of the surface uh, here. Uh, so so this is more likely to be symptomatic. Uh, I think that then the other one, uh, though in the past this might have led to acromioplasty, this degree now I think in most people won't lead to an acromioplasty. But what we can see there is an associated bursal side tear here and some bursal side tendinosis of the tendon which need, need to, to, to be described. And there probably is some, some there is probably a, is a connection between the 
uh, bony abnormality here and the partial tear. Okay. Uh, um, well, one, one thing I, 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 I forgot to mention, Near, I think, wrote his article on, on um, acromioplasty um, before um, MRI and before arthroscopy was um, it came out invented. came out in 1983 yeah, something like that yeah uh, so I, I think uh, arthroscopy was already uh, available but not not uh, MR I don't think yeah and it wasn't w widespread in the kind of use that it was a year or two later yeah okay so here's a, where we can see more severe lateral downsloping, but more importantly, when we go anteriorly, we can see a lot of hibernation of the inferior surface of the acromion with probably a little bit of sub, subcortical edema here. Uh, the, the rotator cuff tendon looks like it's in pretty good shape here. On the sagittal images, we can see this hypertrophic bone formation. The normal cortex probably went right along here, and this is all new bone formation from irritation of the bone, probably mechanically. And we can see the bursitis and some irregularity of the superior surface of the supraspinatus tendon. So another uh, lateral downsloping with some uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursitis due to impingement. Now, another thing which can produce impingement is an osochromiale. Again, you're all familiar with these. Uh, these can become unstable and lead to uh, impingement in the rotator cuff outlet. Yeah, I just remember that uh, the normal physis here doesn't close till in the early 20s. Uh, and uh, so I don't overcall uh, osochromiale in, in younger patients. And I won't go through this. There are d different uh, sizes of osochromiale uh, due to the location of the, uh, the lack of, uh, of full uh, fusion of the of the uh, vices. Now, another thing which you'll see uh, not uncommonly <clears throat> is the fact that the acromion process, instead of articulating with the lateral aspect of the uh, clavicle, actually articulates with the undersurface of the cl clavicle, So, I, uh, uh, which we can see here. So I, I just like to call this inferior placement. Uh, I don't know. There's not a whole lot of literature on this, but uh, uh, there, there are three different um, descriptions of that. Um, um, I don't know why there are three. There, there could be ten, um, because there's there, each AC joint is quite uh, different from any any other. So uh, um, it depends on how the te technique was used in terms of x-ray and or uh, MR, and you, you, you can get different um, type of uh, uh, this placement of, of the AC joint. Uh, but it definitely uh, affects uh, um, um, the rotator cuff. Yeah, so what I see is I, I just describe it as inferior placement. I don't, I don't go through the exact measurements of how more it's, it's inferior to displaced, uh, as opposed to the inferior displacement you see in acute injury or an AC separation, which we'll talk about separately. Uh, but here you can see just uh, the, the normal uh, attachment here of the acromion on the underside of the distal clavicle. I just described this uh, in, in the body of the report. Uh, and then Otherwise, you, you look at the cortex of the acromion like you would in any other situation, and here it looks pretty pretty normal. Uh, and uh, I think John may be right. This may affect the rotator cuff outlet and be a source of impingement, but, but I don't think uh, it has anywhere near the association that a type 3 acromion would have. I just, I just comment on it. Uh, I don't know. Here we can see that there's some superior. I think the only time it's important is when you're doing a, a procedure where a chromioplasty um, or, or AC joint uh, um, right, exit. Something, right. Yeah. 
Uh, now, here's another. Now, th this is another cause of outlet impingement, uh, which can be very symptomatic, and it's congenital. And here, what we see is uh, here's the the muscle and tendon. Now, normally, the muscular tendinous junction should be right at the 12 o'clock position on the humeral head, and here we can see the muscles extending far beyond that, really over to here, and uh, and therefore, instead of the distance between the humeral head and the acromion being the thickness of the tendon, is the thickness of the tendon plus a lot of muscle. And in this case, we also see a lot of injury to that distal muscle in this case. And, and this is uh, having a distal muscular tendinous junction. We'll look at, see a lot of other areas in the body where this can be a congenital variation. But when you have uh, a distal muscular tendinous junction, in an area where you normally have a bony, narrowed anatomy due to the bone, you can get impingement upon the muscle and, and symptoms. And I, uh, well, the first time this came to my uh, knowledge was when I was imaging a professional wrestler uh, in, uh, in, when I still lived in Santa Barbara. And he traveled all around the world, and he would run, he was a huge, huge man. And they'd they'd have the wrestling competitions, and he was one of the world champions. And he could do he could pick up a three hundred pound person and throw him across the room, but he couldn't carry his luggage. He had to have people carry his luggage wherever he went. And the problem was, as long as his arms were up, uh, then the muscle was proximal to this area, and he didn't get any impingement or uh, uh, on the on the distal muscle, but when his arms were at his side, it was painful for him to even pick up his suitcases because that was in an impinged position. And so here we can see a distal muscular tendinous junction. Here's my ex my experience was with a weight lifter. Yeah, he, he, his arms were in abduction uh, chronically. And uh, he couldn't lower his arms from about 70 degrees of abduction. And uh, he got tired of it because he was having pain all, uh, all the time. Yeah. And so we operated on him. It was actually my partner's uh, patient. So he did uh, uh, the surgery. Uh, and uh, we just um, released everything. Um, and um, there was a lot of tissue that we released. I was a little worried about it. He turned out okay, uh, yeah. probably because he couldn't lift anymore. <laughs> okay. So here again, you can see that that muscular tendon disjunction is very distal here. Uh, so another case where I just I just comment that there's a distal muscular tendon disjunction uh, with uh, muscle extending into the uh, rotator cuff interval, or I mean the rotator cuff outlet. So the treatment for these, if you have a type 3 acromion, it's really an acromioplasty. And here is an example where you can see that uh, osteophyte, and you remove the osteophyte, which often also releases the uh, corcoacromial ligament here. Uh, and uh, this is a procedure that uh, I still see it occasionally now acutely, but I, I mostly see it in older people who had it done 15 to 20 years ago. But, uh, and here, before and here is after. Uh, chromioplasty. Uh, actually, I'm getting a little tired of talking here. Okay, so looks like there's some fluid in the subacromial slash subdeltoid bursa, and there's some bursal sided fraying. Um, let's say the myotinous junction looks like it's a little distal. And there's, I don't know if there's some, yeah, it looks like a, a hook there um, and some uh, undersurface changes of the acromion. I think uh, it looks like it's, it looks like it's some versatile sided tearing there due to the acromion. There's a little versatile side Yeah. Here's the acromioplasty back here, but the acromioplasty was too far posterior. And the area of the impingement was the anterior margin, and that was left present. So this was an incomplete acromioplasty, so the patient continued to have symptoms. Yeah, the hibernation is anterior. 
And so this was done backwards, uh, which is kind of obviously didn't help the patient any. Okay. Um, so is this also status post of chromioplasty? Looks yes. maybe because chromium looks diminutive, although maybe there's a little piece of fragment right lateral to that, but there's also a pretty significant undersurface sprain of the distal clavicle, which maybe they should have. Distal spurring of the What do you think about um, how much of a, a, an acromion this patient has? It's diminutive. It looks to me like there's uh, very little left. Yeah, the, the, the chromium. That's not, not not very good, is it? So it's after chromioplasty, but they did not take out the. Uh, uh, I'd like to see a few more cuts on this, if but we don't have them. I don't think. Yeah, I think. Uh, what John is. Th th this is too much. Too too much of that chromium uh, removed. If I read this right you're right john uh, a common problem there are two common problems in doing a chromioplasty where people can continue to have symptoms you have to you have to be very careful uh, as to where the um, deltoid attaches you have to go just underneath uh, where the deltoid attaches and go proximally um, and posteriorly uh, so uh, you got to be cautious. Uh, the problem here, of course, is a clavicle um, and that osteophyte. Um, how much that um, impinges on a on a supraspinatus, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you would be able to tell, John, if if you had a, um, a, a sagittal view. Yeah. Right. And then, well. There are a couple, couple of things here. One is when you do an acromioplasty, like almost every, everywhere else, what you want to do is go back to what you think should be the normal anatomy. If you overdo it, that can lead to a lot of problems, and you can see this in the elbow and, and, and other areas where, where, where people do these. Uh, with the acromioplasty, if you remove too much, then you start developing superior instability, or you can get to a point where you can actually get a tear of the deltoid off of the acromion, uh, which is not something you want to have happen. Mm -hmm. And then the other problem is that if you have an osteophyte like here, the distal clavicle, if that's not taken care of at the same time, you can end up with persistent uh, impingement, but now with more instability. And that's what happened to this patient. John? Yeah. Uh, The, the deltoid, deltoid muscle is, is a very, very important structure around the shoulder because it rotates the shoulder, it abducts the shoulder, and um, uh, you, you cannot do much without a deltoid. Um, all the other muscles around the shoulder are not as important as a deltoid. Uh, so it, it, it's... Uh, if you release it from the chromium, uh, even a sonometer, uh, you, you got problems um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, shoulder activity. It, it, it's it's it, it's a muscle that's uh, of all the muscles in the shoulder, I'd say the deltoid is the most important one especially with older individuals who get degenerative disease and you want to think about shoulder replacement, the deltoid is a key uh, structure for when you do shoulder replacements. But we'll talk about that later. Okay. All right, so he has posterior shoulder pain and acromioplasty four years ago. Um, so there is a prominent osteophyte there along the inferior chromion. It looks like he may have developed recurrent osteophytes. The native chromion, the cortex probably... Is that an osteophyte, John? I think so, John. 
and, and that that looks like a type three acromion without an osteophyte anteriorly. I, I believe that the native cortex would have gone right through here. And that what we see here, this is all an acquired osteophyte. That's osteophyte? I think so. Yeah, I, I, I was, I, I can't be sure. Uh, you're, 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 you're the radiologist, huh? Okay. And then here we can see some downsloping of the acromion. Uh, the thing here, the patient had an acromioplasty, but uh, this large osteophyte really wasn't removed at that particular time. And then you can see a lot of irregularity where they did do it. Oh, I see. Okay. And they can come back too, I, I believe. They can, they can come back. back. <laughs> and then here is another, here again, the, the native. The chromium cortex would probably be right about through here. Here's the patient who had an acromioplasty. They removed this. Notice that the corcoral ligament, which comes through here, is now released. You don't see it anymore. And uh, that's the uh, post acromioplasty images. We don't remove that anymore uh, routinely yep. unless it's really thick and, and uh, fibrotic. Uh, it's left alone now. Yeah. It used to be near recommended that you excise each one of them uh, every time you did that chromioplasty, but uh, that went by the wayside. Yeah, and there was a time when people liked to get rid of the corcochromial ligament, and now it was believed that that led to abnormal anterior instability. So again, as John was saying, you like to leave that structure intact now if you can. Okay. All right. Ashley, what do you think of this case? This was a little old lady who had trouble carrying her groceries. Um, I see some degenerative changes of the AC joint. I think the myotendinous junction looks a little bit distal than I normally see it. But... Well, here I think what we're seeing is inferiorly here, pressing down on the superior surface of the supraspinatus, and then uh, this area is all getting rubbed out to here when she raises her arm, and then this is more normal tendon out here. So I think this is all tendinosis due to AC joint callus formation in this particular patient. So this would be AC joint uh, impingement. Uh, so actually, uh... They talked about this in the recent radiographics article. Um, this is a uh, basically giant cystic structure superior to the AC joint, and it's caused by uh, basically tear in the AC ligament and a rotator cuff arthropathy and joint fluid being kind of, they call it geyser, like shooting up into the uh, AC joint and then coming out and forming these giant cysts. This is on the geyser side. And you can get these very large superior cysts here. Uh, right. Okay, and so uh, so here are uh, you know, fat super. This is uh, arthrogram. This is a PD fat set on the left, a T1 uh, fat set on the right, and you kind of look at the. There's a little bit of degenerative disease here. Uh, the rotator cuff looks like it's pretty intact, maybe a little bit of tendonotic changes. But then if you look at the uh, not fat suppressed image, you can actually see it's really hard to appreciate the fact that you've got significant inferior uh, displacement of the superior surface of the supraspinatus tendon due to uh, prominence of the distal clavicle in this particular patient. So again, the most valuable contrast agent in the body for the musculoskeletal system is fat. And you, if you, you can't have just fat suppressed images in any plane, in my opinion. Um, uh, I, I just did, I just had a study uh, two weeks ago before I went on vacation where they did an MR arthrogram of the shoulder at one of our centers and they only did fat suppressed images. And so I had to have the patient come back and do 
you know, three quarters of a, of a normal examination before I'd read the study, and it turned out the non-fat suppressed images gave some key information in that particular patient. So just remember, uh, uh, if you're overly fat suppressed, you're, you're going to miss a lot of things. So that just, okay. Uh, this was someone who had chronic shoulder pain for many years and was a big uh, handball player. Okay. So here on the radiographs, we can see some large inferior chromial osteophytes. Um, or distal clavicle osteophytes. And then we can also see them on the corresponding MR image with some depression or indentation of the supraspinatus. This, this was my father-in-law, and we decided to try a new coil, and the images weren't very good. This was a coil that, that flunked the test. Uh, but here we can see the coronal uh, T1-weighted images, depression of the supraspinatus there, and here on the sagittal images, we can see the osteophytic changes there and the deformity of the superior surface. So he, th he then actually, they went in and removed this osteophyte. And he was unable to play handball for about six months before this study. Uh, he was back playing handball about four weeks after they did the, uh, the chromial, the distal clavicle uh, osteophyte resection and was essentially asymptomatic two months later for the first time in five years. So these can be debilitating. So the classic treatment in this particular area for these distal clavicular osteophytes is a month of procedure. Uh, uh, classically, you remove about the distal 10 millimeters of the clavicle, uh, and you end up with a widened AC joint space here. Uh, now, sometimes people, instead of doing a full Mumford, will just shave off the, uh, the osteophyte, which is what they actually did to my former father-in-law. Uh, you can't go too much more than that because you don't want to get into the CC ligaments and, and make it unstable. And, uh, and they've been mod modifying the Mumford also, uh, especially arthroscopically. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting how uh, Monfort uh, describes a procedure and then has about a hundred different individuals modifying it. Yeah, really. uh, one thing that we didn't uh, mention um, in the beginning, John, that, that, uh, anybody want to guess how many different uh, examinations uh, we have for the shoulder for different um, pathologies? Examinations or, or surgeries, or both? Examinations. Okay. I'm sure there are a lot more surgeries. Uh, that there are a hundred different examinations. And how many are um, um, helpful? Anybody want to guess? That might be in the eye of the beholder. Why don't you tell us? Actually, none of them are really all that helpful. Uh, they're only helpful in the sense. John, are you still with you, you eliminate pathology from the neck and other pathologies uh, away from the shoulder. So that's how they become important. Otherwise, uh, examining the shoulder is of very little importance, but you should examine the shoulder before all the operations so you're not operating on somebody who has a, a neck problem rather than a shoulder problem. It was rather interesting reading uh, recently for me. For someone who's such a stunt advocate in doing the physical examination, I'm surprised to hear that coming from your lips. Uh, I read it from the, 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 the so-called Bible of orthopedics, John. Right. Uh, I don't have to agree with it, but uh, <laughs> it, it did make a little sense to me. Okay. Uh, you know, you have a hundred different uh, examinations and uh, none of them are uh, helpful, uh, even if you put them all together. Uh, so 
but the importance is that you eliminate other pathologies from other parts of the body. Good. Thanks, John. That's very interesting. Uh, actually, it, it was interesting to me, too. Yeah. So I lied to you a minute ago. This was actually my ex-father-in-law, and he actually had a Mumford procedure. So you can see on the plain films the surgical removal of the distal clavicle here and the loss of the distal clavicle on the MR scan. But notice you no longer have impingement upon the supraspinatus. You know what's interesting, John? That's the modern technology that's described. It's an oblique cut of the um, clavicle. You notice it's oblique rather than um, yes. uh, 90 degrees. Yeah. And that's what's recommended now. Interesting. Good. Okay, let's see, who's next? Jennifer? So, um, this looks like there's inferior displacement of the humeral head with respect to the glenoid, and there's some large enthesophytes along the greater tuberosity. Um, which I think this could be chronic, ero chronic re osseous remodeling, uh, maybe due to a prior dislocation that was never treated. Not sure. Or congenital. Dislocation or, or fracture. Uh, I, I, I didn't see that. Uh, I, I said it before I saw that. <laughs> Yeah, so this was an old fracture. So another way you can get bony impingement is from fractures and abnormal bony anatomy uh, if it does if it doesn't heal properly. So here, this was a fracture involving the greater tuberosity and portion of the articular motorcycle jockey. Probably, probably, and you get proximal displacement of the greater tuberosity from the pull from the rotator cuff, but you have inferior placement and rotation of the of the articulating surface of so. It'd be interesting to try to fix that. I, I wouldn't know how. Um, and, and, and I think if he's old enough, a reverse yeah, replacement would be the, the, the thing to do. I think you're right. Okay, so um, looking at the distal chromium, there's uh, the proximal chromium looks like there's a very prominent osteophyte and a lot of soft tissue there um, surrounding that acromial surface. Um, the bursa, yeah, some bursitis there, and then there's a large osteophyte extending off the superior humeral head. I think that's an osteophyte. It looks like it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. there you go. Is, is, could that be calcium that that's turned to bone? You mean in through here? Yes. Yeah, it, it was mature bone on that plain film. Because it, it, it's pointing in the wrong direction for, <laughs> for, a, for, a, for a fracture yeah. or, a, or an osteophyte. Yeah, this was, but this was post-traumatic. This patient was involved in trauma yeah. prior fracture. Looks like a fracture of the uh, greater tuberosity. Yeah. yeah. So then there's anterior impingement, and this occurs when the coracoid process and the uh, uh, anterior aspect of the humeral head uh, come in too close proximity. Uh, which we can see here, and a treatment for this would be a resection of a portion of the coracoid process. Now, in, in looking at this, uh, generally it's believed that there are several ways to look at the anatomy looking at increased risk. And generally, the, if the, you have a high riding coracoid process like we see here and here, uh, that's supposed to place the patient at very low risk for anterior impingement. As you get more in the normal position here, it's kind of intermediate, 
but most people who have symptomatic anterior impingement have an inferior location of the corticoid process. So it's a true congenital uh, uh, abnormality. And, and this produces uh, this what's called the chevron sign. And if you draw a, a, uh, a four-sided object going from the anterior chromium to the corticoid process to the superior aspect of the glenoid and back to the posterior uh, scapula, uh, if it looks very well, like this chevron sign, then that's uh, a major factor in, in determining risk for uh, anterior impingement, but, but not the only one. Uh, so here we can see in the sagittal plane, this is a superiorly positioned coracoid process. In another patient, we have a more normal position of the coracoid process. And get a little bit more of a chevron sign on that one. Uh, and the other thing to look at, and I think this is a bit more reliable, is really the anterior space that we have here between the humeral head and the coracoid process. If you have a superiorly placed uh, coracoid process, then it's not going to get narrowed because in order to get it really narrowed, you have to have the coracoid process at the level of the widest part of the humeral head. And if you have a superiorly placed coracoid process, you're above that level. <laughs> so by looking at the axial images, if you see that the coracoid process is at the level of the largest uh, circumferential diameter of the humeral articulating surface, then, then there's, there's a chance of being at risk. And then you look at the distance between here. And uh, you can have a very wide distance there, as we're seeing here. And notice we're a little bit more superiorly placed here. And, the, and therefore, the coracoid process is a lot farther away from the humeral head. Or you can be more narrowed. So this is, this is a superior placed coracoid uh, process. This is a more inferiorly placed coracoid process. And you can have a very big difference in that anterior interval due to that placement, which we can see here. So, uh, and then... There have been papers looked at measuring this distance, and it turns out your risk for symptomatic disease increases once this distance is less than seven millimeters. But again, my primary uh, criteria for making this diagnosis isn't this distance either. Uh, and, and this distance uh, and can be narrowed by a lot of factors. One is if you have a rotator cuff tear, and you have a kind of a higher coracoid process, but you have a rotator cuff tear and a little bit of superior migration of the humeral head, then you can get narrowing of this particular distance as well. Uh, so there are a lot of factors, so that would be more normal. So uh, this was a study we did a couple of years ago looking at the effect of the, the amount of rotation of the humeral head and looking at this distance. So we image patients with internal rotation, neutral, and external rotation of the humerus, and looked at this particular distance and measured, measured it here. Uh, this is in uh, neutral position. This is in internal rotation. And we also did it in external rotation. And we can see that there's a significant difference in these measurements based upon how much you internally or externally rotate the shoulder. And therefore, if you're going to use <laughs> A measurement as your criteria, then you have to make sure that you <coughs> position the shoulder precisely the same amount of rotation each time. And let me tell you, that's not possible. All of these patients who were scanned here, well, I'm sorry, oh, let me go back a little bit. Uh, we also did another study where we actually looked at the degree of rotation and and the humerus in people who we did who we scanned, <coughs> and the techs are all taught that they should be scanned in as externally rotated position as the patient finds comfortable. Uh, that's what we like to do, and I'll explain to that when we talk about rotator cuff tears, because that's where that's most important. But it turned out that the degree of rotation was kind of all across the board, and most patients who have symptomatic disease of the shoulder, the more externally rotated, the more painful it is, and the more likely they are able to, they're, they're going to move. So it turns out that a lot of patients who have pathology of the shoulder are going to want the shoulder to be in more internal rotation. So it's very hard to uh, control the degree of internal and external rotation, but it's important for this particular measurement. Uh, this was just uh, looking at a control group. And typically we found that there was about, uh, in neutral position, about 11 millimeters 
uh, that measurement between the uh, humeral head and the, and the cord process. Oh, and this is, okay, uh, th this was where we took in a subject who uh, we positioned at different degrees of internal and external rotation. And did the, this is the left side and this is the right side. This patient had a, a small full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon on the right side, but not on the left side. And we found that uh, they had actually in, uh, uh, in severe internal rotation, uh, I had less than three millimeter separation there. So, uh, uh, but I, I have no symptoms of internal of, of internal or of anterior impingement. So, so this made me a little bit concerned about using just a number uh, to, to make the diagnosis. So the, the rotation needs to be taken into account. And uh, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, what I think is the, the key thing about making a diagnosis is not so much the, the distance, though, I, I'm, I do mention it if it's less than seven millimeters, but it's whether or not you have edema within the, uh, the humeral head uh, adjacent to it. That seems to correlate much better with symptoms and anterior impingement. Is edema the anterior humeral head? Yeah, I'll, I'll show examples of it. I don't know if we have time today or not. Uh, here's a case of, inter, of internal rotation. And here's actually the biceps tendon attached to the coracoid process. And you can see with very extreme internal rotation, you can actually uh, have it so that the coracoid process more articular, uh, narrow, gets just close actually to the biceps tendon in severe internal rotation. Here, this patient has a partial tear of the subscap, uh, which we can see there. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> And uh, in another cut, we can see here's the coracoid process, marked narrowing here anteriorly, involving lesser tuberosity. So, uh, and this was down to five millimeters. So with really severe internal rotation, and most patients can't get this much internal rotation without symptoms, but you can produce a lot of narrowing there. And this is just different levels. Uh, I think this might have been me. No, maybe somebody else. And in the sagittal plane, you can also see uh, uh, the, the difference, and you can see here also why it's not uncommon with true core cord impingement that you can also get biceps tendinosis because with a lot of internal rotation uh, that can pinch upon the biceps. So what I like to look for is narrowing there, but I also like to look for edema within the lesser tuberosity uh, uh, right across from the core cord process. To me, that seems to be uh, a, a better indication of whether this patient can have symptoms from anterior shoulder disease uh, than just the measurement alone. So when I see that, I then comment on it. So here's an example where you can see narrowing of that space. You can see that biceps tendon right between the two, which is where, why you can get biceps disease with this, and the edema within the uh, subcortical bone, uh, that lesser tuberosity uh, due to the impingement process. And this is probably a combination of disease from the from the biceps tendon. And as you know, if you have tendon and ligament changes next to a bone, you can get these subchondrocystic changes as well as mechanical uh, impingement with the coracoid process there. I've almost never seen edema on the coracoid side. The edema is, all, is almost always on the humeral side. So uh, that's a, so I like, the, look, I like to look at the measurements. I like to describe the location of the biceps tendon. But remember, most of the time in these patients, the, the shoulder is going to be more externally rotated, which takes the biceps away from the coracoid process. But that doesn't mean that at times when they're using the shoulder and they're an internally rotated, that it's not going to cause biceps disease. And that's one thing to always remember in imaging is that the anatomy may be different in the position where they, they use their, their, their shoulders than the one that you actually image them in. John? Uh, is this fellow um, a weightlifter? Uh, looks like it. I don't know, but it surely looks like it. The reason I ask is that uh, the pectoralis major um, would be involved in this by um, pulling uh, 
the head of the humerus immediately against the coracoid yeah. and, and and pinching all the other structures. Yeah, could be. Yeah. And, and, and these weightlifters love to have big pecs. Yeah, that's right. So, well, let, let's stop at this point and we'll go on to uh, internal uh, We'll go on to further discussion of internal impingement with GERD, but but this is we need to talk about overhead throwers at this point, uh, which is a much longer discussion. So why don't we stop here, uh, and we'll continue uh, the discussion of internal impingement. Have a good um, um, evening of the second day of the fall. Okay. Thanks, Take care.